I surprisingly found something that I enjoy even more than chess, which is economics. Now, uh, I may be the only economist here at the conference. I think that's probably right, but tell me if I'm wrong. And um, I guess some of you probably uh, don't think that economics is particularly useful, and many of you probably don't think that economics is very interesting, and some of you might not even know what economics is. Uh, but I'm here to try and convince you otherwise. The title of the presentation is What Economists Can Learn From Chess, but realistically, the message that I want to send is the other way around. What you can learn from economists and why you might be interested in working with us in the future. So, to get underway, um, I'll quickly motivate the presentation and then I will teach you economics in two minutes. After which, I'll, we'll try to shed some light on what's happening in the world of economics research related to chess, which is really a big growing field at the moment, with a case study that I think many of you will find interesting about gender and competitiveness. And then I guess the main message, the future, as I see it, for economists and chess practitioners working together. So, uh, like I said, I'm an economist now. I work at the University of Queensland in two particular fields, behavioural economics and development economics, which means I get to work on a lot of topics you might not think of as economics. For example, one of my main projects at the moment is in Somalia, where I'm trying to eradicate female genital mutilation, or female circumcision. You might know this topic, you might not think of that as economics in any way, shape or form. But while I was uh, in Kenya recently on this project, I managed to sneak off for a few days to have a look at the chest there see what's going on. There's some fantastic work being done in the schools there, and I went to a few of the inter-school tournaments, and one thing that really stuck out like a sore thumb is the number of girls playing in their events. I went to some of these school tournaments with uh, four or five hundred kids, of which 60 to 65 percent were female. Incredible numbers. But of course the question is, what happens then? Because you look at the Kenyan Chess Federation, you look at their teams, you look at their rating lists, and of course we're back to our usual story the women disappear. Now this is not just Kenya, this is a global issue. Here is a figure that's come out from a very recent paper by a couple of uh, very good French economists. This is the distribution of males and females from the FIDE rating list, so these are sort of frequencies. On the right we've got the male distribution, it's, it's quite well known this sort of thing, it's reasonably flat and we actually have this second wind, so this is the birth year at the bottom here. So we see that the males drop off a little bit around the age of 18, 19, 20, but then once they reach sort of an early retirement, they sort of even make a little bit of a resurgence. But for females, it's exactly the opposite story. It's coming completely different. Around 18, 19, 20, it drops off extremely sharply, and it never comes back. So, why might this be? You probably already have the answer in your heads, right? You've already got ideas. Interestingly, if we asked you all, they might be different. Now, one idea that many of you might have had is, well, women are different because they have babies. Makes sense, right? But the data suggests that this is only a small part of the story, in fact. There's a lot more going on with these differences, and we don't quite understand it. One of the big topics, the big hypotheses put, being put forward is competitiveness. We've measured and we find that women seem to be less competitive than men. And this is what economists are very much interested in, getting into the mechanisms. Not just that women are less likely to participate in chess than men, we want to know why. And once we find some answer, like competitiveness, we want to know why again. We keep wanting to know why. So the next question is, is it a nature argument or a nurture argument? And this is very important for what we do about it as policymakers. If women are just naturally, biologically less competitive than men, then that suggests one particular policy angle, which is probably, there's not much we can do about it. But if it's a nurture argument, if they're brought up, if something happens during high school such that they start to dislike competition, then that suggests very different responses that we can come up with. Now, this is obviously a very important question for most of the people in the room. For us here, we're interested in this sort of stuff. But why would economists care if not many girls are playing chess? Well, to answer that question, we need to know what economics is. And now I'm going to teach you economics in two minutes. For those of you who have never taken an economics course, or who did take a course but slept in the back row, now is your chance to learn economics in two minutes. So, this is how most of you see economics, I would imagine. There are two fields you might have heard of, macroeconomics and microeconomics. And when I go to family dinner parties and, and uh, my grandparents find out that I'm an economist, they ask me, so what's gonna happen to unemployment next year? 
Also, what's Brexit going to do for the GDP of England? I have absolutely no idea. That is macroeconomics, and that is based around national economies. Output, inflation, unemployment, and all these crazy terms you might have heard of, particularly at the moment, international trade, recessions, Chicago school, all this sort of stuff. Only about 30% of economists work in macroeconomics, even though for most of the public, this is what they see our field as. 70% work in microeconomics, which is where I work and what I consider to be far more interesting. Microeconomics looks at decisions at the micro level. And usually that's individuals, but it can also be couples making a decision within the household or the head of a household making decisions for their children. And so we're really interested in understanding how people make decisions to do the best that they can, can, that they can with the limited resources that they've got. And these are some of the sort of questions that we're interested in understanding, these sort of decisions. So how many hours should I work in my job? Should I go to university or maybe should I study a trade or become a professional chess player? Should I take the bus to work every day? Should we have a baby? Should we have another baby? And something like as simple as I have 50 pounds, I'm going to the supermarket, what should I buy? These are the sort of questions we're interested in. In my case in Somalia, I want to know why, if you've got a daughter who reaches the age of 10, you make the decision whether or not to circumcise her. That's a very big decision that's made at the individual level, and we need to understand it, and policymakers need to understand it. Now, within microeconomics, there are a number of subfields that you might have heard of before. <coughs> Behavioural economics, that's one of mine, very closely related to psychology, really founded by this guy, Herbert Simon, you might have heard of, very famous both chess player and chess researcher. You might also know some books in the popular press at the moment, like Thinking Fast and Slow by Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, or Freakonomics, or Predictably Irrational, that's this sort of field. Game theory, which deals with strategic interactions, labor economics, and then a bunch that I've put in light blue, which have very specific applications. So health economics, education economics, development economics, that's my second one, environmental economics, and others. And I've put those in light blue because they can be lumped together into this field with a slightly awkward name called Applied Microeconometrics. And basically, what that means in Applied Microeconometrics is that we're trying to work out whether something causes something else. And the key word there is causes. We're all about identifying causality. Now, you know that correlation doesn't equal causation. You must have heard about this before. We're trying to distinguish between those two things. So, for example, some of the old chess literature, the chess education literature, might come up with conclusions such as, from our surveys, kids who learn chess are more intelligent. That tells us absolutely nothing as policymakers, because kids who are more intelligent are more likely to go into chess in the first place. We're not comparing apples and apples. What we want to do is conduct studies where we get conclusions like this. Learning chess makes kids more intelligent, and that's a very different thing. So now you've learned economics, well done. I now want to speak a little bit about one of the areas where economists are really focusing on chess as part of their research, and that is gender and competitiveness. Now this is a very important topic in economics and also for public policy makers, because it is at the heart of some very big and very topical issues, such as should we have affirmative action policies or quotas in the universities or workplace? How do we encourage more women to enter and stay in the workforce? What are the effects if we change maternity laws? This is a big one now. Why are girls dropping out of STEM fields after secondary school? So STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Across the world, in most countries, we actually find more girls in high school taking up these subjects and on average doing better than boys but we reach university and it completely disappears. So it's a big question to try and work out why this is happening. So, we've tried to get into this in various ways. Economists use various different types of experiments for this. And I should just mention briefly, when I was invited to give this talk, for some reason I had it in my head that we would sort of be half researchers and half chess practitioners, and now I've realized this is really not the case. So there is a workshop this afternoon on making research more relevant in chess. <laughs> Um, which I'll be chairing in some of the more, I don't know, technical, researchy type stuff. I'm going to leave till then, so I might skip over the few things a bit more. But I do encourage you all to attend if you're interested in the stuff that we go through here. So um, these are some of the experiments um, that, uh, that economists have looked at to really dig deep and try to get into the mechanisms. And I've, I've made red and bold these two words here, mechanisms and external validity. So mechanisms are 
for example, you have the question of um, does chess improve mathematics, for example? Well, what part of chess? If we teach them chess to become chess players, if we want to improve their rating, or if we use chess mini games, or if we simply give them something to do after school instead of going off and, and ruining their lives. Like, what, what is it? What's the mechanism? That's what we're interested in, getting into those sort of things. The problem is, to find mechanisms, we often have to sacrifice external validity. We might have to look in such weird situations as female tennis players versus male tennis players to understand a particular mechanism, in this case, pressure, in pressure environments. But can we really say that something that we find in tennis can be applied to the workforce when you're going for promotion? That's the issue of external validity. And we'll talk about these two topics in the workshop this afternoon. And this leads into the difficulties of doing research onto this gender type issue. The first is it's really hard to find high quality data of situations where there is both gender and competition. The second is it's really hard to rule out selection. Now what I mean by selection here is this correlation versus causality type thing. And that is kids who are more intelligent to begin with select themselves into playing chess more often. That's an issue for us. And the third is it's very hard for us to measure the underlying ability in our data. And that's why chess data has become a hot topic amongst economists. Now we know that our chess data is great because we chess players are meticulous at recording everything. Every move we make, the date that it's happening, the times we've got on the clock. So that's really good. It's nice quality data where we can track individual performance across time. But in terms of whether or not it's relevant for answering questions in the workplace, well, we have a competitive environment in a cognitive domain where males and females compete on an equal playing field. That's very, very hard to find in research. So that's also why it's quite appealing. There are a couple of other things in there that are interesting. It's a global sample, cross-country. We can slice and dice the data by different sorts of countries, expertise, gender, age. And there are a couple of other technical elements in here, such as the use of ELO ratings and the fact that in chess pairings you can't choose who you play against, that we can use for technical reasons to try and analyse things statistically. So it's really great for economists and they've started being attracted to our field in droves. In terms of gender competition in chess, there are three recent papers, one that's been published in Psychological Science and two other ones that are all attacking this exact issue using chess data. Now I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of details about this, but as a, as a good researcher I've tried to squeeze as much into my presentation as possible, but to be nice to Carl, I've made two appendices in the slides. So afterwards you can download these slides and at the end they're all hyperlinked, you can click on them and get to the different appendix. And what I've got here is my, my brief summary of the different papers, the different methodology and results in just one slide per one, so you can have a look at it there. So I won't go through those details here. Suffice to say they are incredibly interesting for how women react when they're being paired against another woman versus another man and vice versa. These three papers use three interesting sources of data. One is FIDE ratings data, which, is, which FIDE collects but does not uh, publish or make publicly available. The second are chess databases, Megabase, Twip, and so forth. And the third one that I'm using now is Lee Chess, which was a presentation was given by the Lee Chess guys yesterday. They have different characteristics for why they might be useful. The first one, FIDE rating data, is incredibly useful, but even though I've petitioned them, I'm still waiting to get access to it, so it's a bit tricky. The second one, the chess-based data, is becoming really interesting because people are using computers to run through evaluations of every move that gives them this massive big data sample. And the third one, which I'm working on now, well actually, my assistants are working on, to be fair, back in Australia, has over 500 million games. So we're really talking about big data, and the good guys at LeechS have made that all freely available for download if you've got a big enough USB stick. So that's what a lot of the researchers are doing, but more importantly, why would you be interested in working with economists? And why would economists be, working, uh, be interested in working with chess practitioners? Well, the economic way of thinking is really valuable. It's become scientifically accepted. Governments are really interested in this sort of stuff, and you should be too. It's got three different elements to it. The first, you come up with theoretical models of behavior, perhaps influenced by the experience and anecdotes that you bring from your wealth of experience. That can be then tested using sophisticated statistical techniques on the data that we have available to try to work out these mechanisms and this cause and effect. And we can use this together to propose ways to improve the different programs and policies that we've got in place. 
So it's really coming down to this mechanism type stuff. For example, some sub-questions might be, what are the mechanisms of chess education that are most beneficial? And if we find one that works very well, can we be sure that it's gonna work on kids with ADHD? Can we be sure that it's gonna work on inmates in prison? Those sort of questions are what we're interested in, in economics. Um, and then right down the bottom here, one way that we can uh, improve policies and programs in the future with our evaluations is to design scalable interventions that are often uh, based around these things called randomised controlled trials, or RCTs, which you might have heard about before. Now this is sort of the gold standard for this research at the moment. It's been used by the World Bank, it's used by the UN, it's used by a lot of top NGOs. We love this sort of stuff, particularly when there is a very interesting but challenging question we want to look at. A researcher for this needs, at a minimum, an intervention, that's fine in our case because your programs, your projects, are the interventions. So we've got that covered. You need a randomised treatment group and control group, you need good measures of outcome, and you need baseline, uh, baseline data as well as exit data. I mention these things because what a lot of people don't, don't realise is that the researcher really wants to get in when you're starting a project, or you're starting a program on a new set of people. So to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this program with the kids for a couple of years and after three or four years then I'll, then I'll get someone to evaluate it. It might be a little bit too late. There are things that we can do, but engaging or at least having a conversation with the researcher early on is really useful and I wanted to make that quite clear. So, RCTs I think are a fantastic way for researchers and for chess practitioners to partner together. I think there are some great benefits. And I prepared two slides, one tips for working with applied economists and one, tips for researchers who want to work with chess practitioners. Now for the second one, I think there is no one here who's going to be interested in it, so I won't go through that one too much, but suffice to say, a lot of the points are very closely related to each other. In fact, the first one is word for word identical, and that is you want to make your objectives and your outcomes and expectations very clear at the start. You want to have that conversation. The good thing about working with a, with a researcher or applied economist in chess research is that our incentives are pretty much aligned. Most researchers, and the ones that you'll see around here at this conference, we are intrinsically motivated. We are interested in chess and its benefits. We want to get involved. We're not just there to grab a publication and then leave you. So that's already a good thing. We are going to have some strange things that we might mention to you, some strange requests. Can we change that little part of the delivery of your program? Or can we do this little thing? Please try to be flexible to those sort of things, particularly if it's not going to negatively impact your program. Although some researchers might push you hard and then you want to say no, that's a lever that we're not going to change. But these little changes can really help us to evaluate things better and to work out these mechanisms. And working out these mechanisms is good for you. They're good for us and it's good for you because at the end of the day, you should be open-minded to the data-driven findings we come up with because Okay, at the end of the day, you know best. There's no question about that. You're there with the kids, you're there with your communities, uh, you have the experience. We're just the guys playing around with data. But the data might reveal some surprising things that you might want to investigate, or some particular groups of children who are getting some benefits and others not. So I think there are some nice ways to work together. I've got the other slide here, but that's uh, not so relevant, so I'm gonna skip over it for now. And I think that there are some great benefits for both sides from this. The first for researchers, again, not too many who need convincing here, but it's an ideal testing environment for a number of really interesting questions, such as composition and gender, but there are others as well. And there is excellent data available, both secondary and data we can collect together in RCTs. For chess practitioners, this quality impact evaluation is really beneficial. And we've spoken about this the last two days here in a number of environments. If you want to go to the government, you want to get funding for a project, or you already have funding, but you want to make it self-sustainable, you want it to keep coming, you're competing with a number of other lobbyists who are trying to get money from the government. And as we know, the pool of money available is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Quite often they'll say, yeah, you've got some great stories here from parents, but where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? And I think it's really beneficial to have some on the side here. You can also, as I mentioned, get insights into mechanisms that might be surprising and might help you benefit your program uh, in the future. I call it here the education production function. I'm talking also in terms of monetary profit, but mainly in terms of the cognitive and project profits you might be able to get out of it. And together, what can we get? Well, we can increase our chances of attracting funding for both of us, which is important. A lot of the research questions we're investigating, they don't require big changes. So it's a great way to work together. 
and most importantly, it can strengthen the link between research and practice. I've listed a bunch of academic ideas. Again, this was mainly for a researcher's audience, so I think we'll talk about this more in the workshop. But just to try and link all the way back to what I said at the start, an interesting question I think that chess data can allow us to answer is, does gender equality in a country affect the gender participation ratio in the chess uh, evidence? Now, I've got my hyperlink here. So here are a list of countries. These are just some random ones that I pulled out recently from the data. Some of you, of course, come from these countries. How would you expect the chess participation ratio between male and female players to be in these countries? Now, you might have better inside information than me, of course, but if I showed this to a non-chess player, to an economist, to a politician who doesn't play chess, they would probably try to link this in to the gender equality within a country. That makes sense, right? Some of these countries here we know are shiny examples of gender equality, others not so much. Well, this is the gender equality index score of the countries. Norway shining the flag at the top. Carl, you'll be happy to know you're third up there. England, fifth in this list, not too bad. Here's Denmark. The, um, this is not the distribution anymore. These are the actual numbers of Danish players playing on the FIDE Online Arena. And I've used gender colours here. Please excuse me for that. But this is blue. These are the boys. Can you see it all right? Well, it's not great on the screen. Maybe we can make that full screen. Oh, yeah, thank you. Now I'll put up the girls, okay? So you'll be able to see the actual difference in numbers. Yeah. Did you see it? I'm not sure if you could see it. See this little, these little red ones down here? They're the girls. In Denmark. What about England? England must be better, right? English chess is booming. I'll put up the girls now. Can you see them? Yeah. Barely. Germany. Where's Boris? Is here? Germany. Okay, Germany, surely Germany. Merkel at the top, right? There are the girls. What about Sri Lanka? What do you know about Sri Lanka? Here are the girls. <coughs> China. Human rights record? Not bad. Not bad. UAE? What do we know about UAE? I got a few others as well, but I think I'm running out of time, so I'll skip it now. But if you run the regressions, you actually you run the stats, you actually find that it's almost exactly flipped. The gender equality index. Now that might be interesting to you and your individual countries. It is certainly very, very interesting to us as researchers. And what we find actually is that when you look at STEM participation, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, you find almost exactly the same thing. There's some very interesting theories for why this might be the case with very interesting implications for policy. I think this is an area that economists are going to be really interested in. So if you want to try and get some free impact evaluations into your program, these and the other research questions I put up before are the sort of hooks, sorry, these other research questions I put up, oh sorry, here, here's the, uh, the ranking by the way, you'll see this in the slides, by chest gender ratio, better at the top, and by gender equality in general. So you can see a bit of the flipping here, you can see that across the board. But these and the other questions I have here are the sort of hooks you might want to use to be able to get researchers in to do some of your scientific evaluation work with you, to work with you for the future to improve your programs. And you can see they can also get some very interesting insights out of it in general. So if you want to contact me or chat anymore, I've got some details up there, but I think my time's up. So thank you very much. All right.